Go live. A little bit late. Seven ten. Got some stuff I'm taking care of. Uh, hopefully, you guys have taken a look at the video that I have up where we compared the did did two comparisons in the video we did the Brian Tully Racing Stage Two Turbo Cam. You know, it's actually a Turbo Cam versus the stock cam, which as it turns out is kind of also a turbo cam. And then I also did the exhaust test comparing the tubular headers to the stock exhaust mount, not stock exhaust manifolds. Actually, those those work very well. And compared to the um, hooker cast uh, turbo manifolds that they have with the cross under pipe going over and merging into the setup, it's a, it's a nice setup because it works very well and fits in a lot of different applications. And I think that they have different cross under pipes for different chassis and things like that and different oil pans and things. So the, that's kind of nice that they were able to make that setup work uh, with a lot of different, you know, en engine configurations and chassis and stuff. So that's kind of cool. So I compared those two, but we'll get to, we'll start off with the camshaft test. And as we saw in the video, if you guys haven't seen it, spoiler alert, um, when you run a stock camshaft with an LS motor, in this case it was an L, <coughs> excuse me, was an LS3, you, you can make good power. I mean, we put a single turbo on it with the Holly setup and it was a junkyard 5.3 that had um, the stock 706 heads with valve springs. It had a stock bottom end. It had the, the Trailblazer SS intake manifold because we were running that, doing some other kind of, some other testing and running the turbo with an intercooler on it. And we were running at about 10 or 11 pounds and it was right at about 600 horsepower. So it did very well. Um, but the thing is that, and, and you could obviously that's with a stock camshaft and you could obviously turn the boost up. So you could, if you wanted to make 700 horsepower, it just means that you need to run more boost even on the stock cam. Cause that turbo that we use was a precision 76, 75 CEA kind of double whiz bang turbo. And it had, we've, we've run near 1200 with that turbo before. So we know it can support a lot more power than we were running it at. It was just kind of getting started. <laughs> Um, but the thing is when we, when we installed the camshaft in it and we put a uh, Brian Tooley racing stage two turbo cam in it, when we put the camshaft in it, the power jumped up dramatically. I mean, it jumped up 120 horsepower, even at the same boost level. And we made no changes to the air fuel and timing. And in this case, we ran this thing. I think it was a mixture of, of 91 and hundred, um, so that we could run enough timing. I think this thing one had 22 degrees in it or so with the intercooler, which is plenty safe with that much octane. Uh, E85 would have obviously been even better, but it just goes to show you that uh, when you put not just this dedicated turbo cam, which will obviously work very well. I mean, this is kind of, this is obviously what it was designed for. But um, if you put a camshaft in there that improves the NA power, which this one did, and you're running the same boost level, you're now multiplying it by some by some bigger number. So the amount of power that you get in our multiplier effect with our horsepower uh, horsepower boost or booster uh, what, what am I looking for? Uh, uh, power boost formula. When you multiply that out, when you're multiplying the same percentage by a bigger number, you get a, a, an even bigger number. And that's all that's happening there is that now our NA power is making more when we put a camshaft in it. And so now under boost, it's going to make even more. So we have greater gains. It would not pick up that camshaft would not pick up 120 horsepower NA, not even anywhere near that. But when you multiply it out, then all of a sudden you can make uh, quite a bit more power. And that's the thing. And that's the first thing that we wanted to talk about um, here is that when you put some kind of camshaft in there, and, and it doesn't have to be on an LS, it could be on anything. It could be a small buck Ford, small buck Chevy, Coyotes, whatever, whatever you're doing. It just allows you to make more power at any given boost level. And that's why we do it. I mean, you the, the conversation here for this particular video was, can we still make more power with a stock camshaft? And yeah, you can. You can with and, and some of them have better cams than others. For instance, an LS3 cam is a lot more powerful cam than the LM7 cam. In fact, almost every camshaft in the LS family in this particular instance would make more power than the LM7 cam does. It, it would hurt response down low. And we saw a little bit of that in the video in the comparison because the stage two cam is like a 226 at 50 cam, which is pretty good size for a 5.3. I, I honestly wouldn't put a camshaft in this if it was my car and I was driving it around and it was and it was any kind of street car. 
I probably wouldn't put that camshaft in it. I would put a smaller one like the the truck Norris cam or something like that. I'd put a smaller camshaft in that would be more responsive down low. And then you just have to run to get to any power level. You just run a little bit more boost, but that way is probably better in my opinion to have more response, which you're gonna like more. And you can still get to whatever the power output of that turbo, of that particular turbo is a pretty healthy one. Um, but you can see that it worked very well. And that's the thing. That's why we put turbos or put camshafts in with turbo motors, because when you do that, the gains are so dramatic. I mean, it's not like you're going from, oh, I picked up, you know, 20 or 30 horsepower, which is not uncommon doing a camshaft on some kind of NA motor. Oh, yeah, I picked up 30 horsepower. That's good. That's We pick that up with like when we do a big block, we do a camshaft on a big block. We might, we might might even pick up a little bit more than that on a big block because it already has a fairly decent head flow and stuff. But that's not an uncommon amount. But when you look at 30 or 40 horsepower or whatever versus 120, um, and on LSs, obviously, even NA, we pick up a lot of power, which is why we get even greater gains when we, when we run under boost. But that's why we do it. Because now all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm only running, I'm running 10 pounds. Yeah, but now I'm making 720 instead of making 600 at 10 or 11 pounds. So that that's kind of why people would want to do cam upgrades in the first place. Obviously, on an LS, a camshaft is usually the first modification, performance modification that you make. It's the go-to thing. And then with boost, you can see why they do that. Because all of a sudden, when you're talking about like adding turbo stuff, you can get big, big power gains, especially if the motor already has a camshaft in it. You can get really big power gains. It's not unusual to get 100, 200, 300, whatever, four or 500 horsepower with the turbo stuff. But when the um, on an NA motor, it's just really hard to get gains like that. But when you put a camshaft in a turbo motor and you get 120 or and, and you we can get a lot more too, depending on what cam we put it in and what boost level we're testing it at. Like when we tested this thing at 20 pounds, the gain <laughs> the gain might be 200 or 250 or 300, whatever the number is. So the gains are really, really big when you start talking about when you start multiplying them by boost. And that and that's why guys do it. It's a, in the in the particular the LS motor gets good gains anyway because it's a combination that basically is just begging for a camshaft. And then once it's boosted, we get the motor that was naturally aspirated begging for a camshaft. And then we now multiply it by boost. So it's like a double whammy and it, and it works out really well. So the next conversation is about the exhaust test. And I, and I think that, well, I'm, I'm certain that uh, I, right off the bat, obviously I should have used an electronic boost controller when I did this test way back and I didn't. And, and that would be a much better way to do it and it would be much more, uh, it would be fair to do it that way and give both exhaust systems like an equal chance because then we could have, uh, ideally we could have the same boost curve and, and the boost would be the same at every RPM. So if we did see a difference, not only because we I was trying to make a point in the video that, okay, right here at this point at 6,200 RPM, we had the same boost in air fuel and timing and, you know, and then the, and that the big difference was back pressure. And we saw a pretty sizable difference in back pressure. The thing is the, the amount of back pressure difference that we saw and then the power difference that I saw just it, to me, it hasn't ever really correlated. I, I, I think that the, that the change in power was too dramatic for what I, what I saw in terms of boost. And the, and the other thing that's really interesting and, and, and the, the other reason that I'm thinking this is because the engine masters guys recently duplicated this test. Basically they did it right. They did it with an electronic boost controller and they, um, and, and they ran it with, with some other cool differences too, that you guys will see when you guys watch that, watch that TV show. Hopefully you guys are all going to tune into that when it comes out, but it won't be out for a while. But when they did the test, they saw a smaller difference than I did comparing these two comparable things, tur turbo headers, the long tube headers, or, or not long tube, but tubular headers uh, versus the Holly setup. And they saw um, much less of a change in power, although they did still see a pretty big change in um, a comparable change in exhaust back pressure which I thought was interesting because um, they they asked me obviously before they did this, they said, well, what, what can we expect to see? And I said, well, here's the kind of boost pressure I saw that I ran it at and here's the kind of back pressure difference I saw and, and, and all of that and gave them all the information. 
and then they they got different different results. And that that doesn't make me think that I'm the only one that knows what's going on and that my test is the only good one. It actually makes me want to go back and look at mine and go, well, why? What could I have done wrong that would? Because I've always thought that the amount of power that I got relative to that boost that that back pressure change was too big. I I just didn't think that that could equate to that. Um, and and especially when I saw. The other thing that is, is really interesting in this particular test, obviously you should have used a boost controller. Um, but the thing that the other thing that's interesting is if we see more back pressure, which we did on the on the cast exhaust manifolds, wouldn't you think that more back pressure there would lend itself to being to making the thing more responsive, right? I mean, those two things go together, and yet they don't. <laughs> That's one kind of consistency that we saw with my test, and, and I'm sure that the guys at Engine Masters also, is that the turbo stuff and the free-flowing exhaust going to the turbo um, actually improved boost response. Even, even with them using an electronic boost controller, um, they saw improved response with the header setup compared to the exhaust manifold, despite the fact that it had more back pressure. So you would think that normally we associate, uh, and, and, and I do this also, normally you associate a change in back pressure because a lot of times the turbo itself is the restriction in, in the setup. So the turbo is the, the thing that flows the least <laughs> in the exhaust system. When you merge all that together, it's got to go through the turbo. That's where, that's where back pressure is. And so when that's the case and you change the turbo to a bigger one, you change, you, we go from a small T4 to like a summit T6, and then we definitely see a change in back pressure. And so usually that's correlated with a change in response. So when we see less back pressure, that turbo, generally speaking, is not as responsive as the one where there's more back pressure. And that stands to reason. I mean, that's, there's a lot of common sense that dictates that's probably going to happen. But that's not what we saw when we were looking at the comparison between the header uh, and and three inch Y pipe. In my case, I don't. I think that I don't know if they had a three inch on theirs. It might have been two and a half. But we didn't see that on that setup versus a cast setup. We saw more exhaust back pressure, but we saw less response from that um, lower exhaust back pressure. And that's probably because the the increase in back pressure was not caused by the turbo. Obviously, because we have two two different systems. Um, we have an actual flow rate change in the exhaust itself, which is not good. And, we, and to put that into perspective, we see that also when we change the exhaust on the other side of the turbo, when, on the exhaust going out of the turbo, when we put a giant size free flowing exhaust, the thing's much more responsive. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have the three inch exhaust on there and the thing's going to be really responsive. No, <laughs> that's not what happens. What happens is when you put a three and a half or four, four and a half or a five, when, when it can flow out as much as it can, that's when it gets really happy and gets really responsive. And by the way, and, and that, that's the other thing I noticed when I was testing this is the, um, the sound of the motor. The motor just sound a lot, sounded a lot different with the headers on it than it did with the Holly stuff. Now I'm, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm knocking at the Holly stuff because it worked very well and I've run it a whole bunch. The other thing that I really like about it much more than the other stuff that I have, like the turned uh, stock truck exhaust manifolds or the, um, or this big header and Y pipe, like the header stuff, I'm not a fan of. <laughs> I don't like the way that they fit. I don't like the way that they don't allow access to the spark plugs and that they tend to want to burn spark plugs because of their proximity to the spark plugs and the wires. So that that setup is not ideal. Like I like the stock exhaust manifolds much better than I like the headers because there's all kinds of access. They flow well. We've, we've made a lot of power. But I do like the Holly setup because it fits so many different applications. It fits so many chassis. And also, it does not burn plug wires. So it has a lot more going for it than, than the headers do. But if you're trying to make a 1500 or 2000 or 2500 you know, horsepower combination, most guys would opt toward making headers. Although if I was doing that in, in my chassis, I would make sure that they wouldn't burn any spark plugs if you were making headers. I don't think I would get these inexpensive off the shelf ones because I just, I don't like having them be that close, especially if you, if you watch one of these things, like with the lights off and the dyno, I mean, a lot of guys don't get a chance to see that because it's under the hood. But if you saw how 
glowy that thing was, <laughs> how hot it actually gets, um, how it glows red hot uh, while you're making runs. And especially, like I said, when the lights are off, you can see what's going on and you're like, oh yeah, I don't want that anywhere near my spark plug wires and stuff. I could see why they want to burn those. So the exhaust the the exhaust test that I did um, was wrong because I didn't do uh, an electronic boost control. So I, and for two reasons. One, I wanted the boost curve to all be the same. So then then we could determine, okay, there is a change in response rate. One of them comes up a little better. Even on the engine dyno, it's not ideal because it doesn't do a transitional response thing. But if you have a big turbo and you load it at 2000 RPM or 2500 RPM and there's no boost response, you just won't see any. And then it will come up when it comes up. And you, we saw this when, when I did the twin turbo stuff on the Big Bang motor. We saw that and... Um, you know, those we purposely sized those because they were so that they were too big and we weren't trying to get it to be real responsive. But you can see the difference between that one and a single one. And, I'm, and I may show that later on in another video where we do this kind of response change or, or, or competition and comparison so you can, guys can kind of see those. And it's not surprising that a single S475 or S480 would be more responsive than two of those. And we did that one on purpose, but you can you can see big things like that on the dyno. You can't see how the thing rolls in and how responsive it gets unless you were really tricky with what you're doing. But you can see um, big changes like I saw, like we saw in the twin turbo versus the single and then the remote stuff versus the standard location and all that. So if the difference is you know fairly substantial, you can see that on the dyno. So we could see changes. Um, if I had the boost controller on there, we could see differences if there were fairly significant differences between the header stuff and, and the cast iron manifolds, we would be able to determine that and it, and it would show on there. So I, I wish I, I would have had that. But the other cool thing that the electronic boost controller would have done is it would have made sure that the comparison numbers were exactly perfect. Like what I think happened in this test is I'm not certain that the two points that I picked to compare them where the dyno was telling me both of these were at 11 pounds. I'm not sure that that boost value was correct on both of those. That's the only thing that I could think. The power numbers, all of that's right. But I'm just wondering if there was something going on with the, um, the pressure sensor in the dyno that maybe it needed to be zeroed on one of them or the other one, or, you know, I just, I, I don't know. Like I said, it just seems like it's, it's the number, the difference just seems like it's too big. I would expect there to be some, you know, we're seeing, a, um, I think a, I don't know, it was an eight or 10 uh, pound or, or yeah, eight or 10 PSI back pressure difference between the two. I would expect there to be something there. I mean, we see that we, there is a difference, but I, I just don't know what that equates to in power. So let me know what you guys think. Is it, um, does it, uh, how much would, um, how much would 10 pounds of exhaust back pressure, how much do you think that that would be worth? How much power would 10 pounds of exhaust back pressure be worth if one of them was 10 pounds higher than the other? And remember, we're not talking about but like one turbo being 10 pounds higher in back pressure than another turbo. We're talking about just the exhaust system being 10 pounds higher in back pressure than another exhaust system. So the turbo stays constant. The exhaust out of the turbo, the discharge, the intercooler, all of that stuff stays constant. So what do you guys think in terms of power? What, what do you think is a realistic number? Is it is it two horsepower? Is it five? Is it one horsepower per PSI? What is there? Is there a ratio there that we need to be looking at? Um, so we will take a look at our, I need to, I need to get, we'll get a, uh, poll going up here. Let's see here. Okay, so here's the poll for tonight. 
would you pick a smaller cam looking at the video that I'm talking about? So we ran a Brian Tooley Racing Stage 2 Turbo Cam on this 5.3 with this Precision Turbo. And you saw how it did. And the question is, would you pick a smaller cam than this Brian Tooley Racing Stage 2 Turbo Cam for your Turbo 5.3? So that's the question. Would you go smaller on the cam? then what's there or would you use that cam or, or you know possibly even something bigger um so if you're going to use a smaller cam it's yes and if you're going to use this size cam or something bigger it's no so let me let me see what you guys got going on in the poll okay so we'll get to some questions now um i have about a half an hour yes everybody remember hit the like button florida's in the house Is it fair to say the whole concept of a turbo cam is just a mild, broad power curve that isn't the highest peak possible because a narrow peak of ridiculous power under boost isn't as useful? No, I, I think it's you should. The way that I look at it, the way that I look cam for cam choices is pick the cam that provides the NA power curve that you want. So if you want something that makes peak power at 7,500 and you're just going to add boost to that, that's all that's going to happen. You're going to add boost to that. So. A cam like that is going to be softer down low and better up at the top. When you add boost to it, it's still going to do that. The, the being soft down low may exaggerate that because the turbo might not now be as responsive. But whatever you're doing, wherever you want your power to be, and more importantly than just the power, how do you want your drivability to be? So like if you pick a you know, stage three or stage four NA or turbo cam in your 4.8, which would be the extreme example in your 4.8 and you're going to put a turbo on it, it's going to be super laggy. That That's the thing that I don't like about that sloppy stage two cam is that for a 4.8, in my opinion, it's it's too big. It doesn't need to be that big on a 4.8 for you to put an S475 size turbo on there or a 7875 VS Racing turbo. That little 4.8 doesn't need the anywhere near that much camshaft unless you plan on running it to 8,000 RPM. So the a lot of guys will take the 48 put that 228 sloppy stage 2 cam and then put a high ram on it and then that's like the worst of all possible combinations again unless you're drag racing and you have a big stall converter and you want to run it at 8000 rpm then the turbo will do that because up, up there if you have a stall speed you know high stall converter and then you're you know you're making all of the power production in that range and you can optimize that that works but for most guys driving around that big of a camshaft especially in a 4.8 I, I don't that's not the thing that i would choose i would pick a small more responsive cam in that combination with a with a and also a slightly smaller turbo too to get the thing to be more responsive and i think that for most street cars that would be a better combination at least for me Yeah, the uh, somebody was mentioning the um, stock exhaust manifolds. That's really common, and that's that's the stock exhaust manifolds. I think would make more power than these Holly manifolds did because I think that they flow more. Holly also has really good um, replacement exhaust manifolds that again can be used like that 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 are not this merge uh, deal um, because that's where the flow restriction is. It's 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 in the passenger side where the cross under tube merges in and and it's and it's and it's flattened and it's it's done it's, it's done mostly for packaging um and so the stock exhaust manifolds will easily go to like you know 1500 horsepower more Uh, Australia is in the house. Let's see here. Um, I just did a turbo test, went from 43 PSI boost and 65 PSI back pressure to 46 PSI boost and 46 PSI back pressure and picked up 15% horsepower. A 15% gain in horsepower at 46 pounds of boost seems like it would be an awful lot. Seems like it's going to be like a few hundred horsepower. <laughs> I 
Dan, you want a big turbo and a big cam? I want power brakes. I want the accessories to work. All of that is, sm is small cam material. And, and the thing is that a lot, and, and we, I've been guilty of this. I was talking to my buddy Jimmy about this too, because we were talking about the old five liter days. And uh, I was a big proponent of making the NA combination as powerful as you can. But most of that was the five liter stuff where you had to put heads and cam and intake manifold on it to make the to make the five liter actually make decent power and then add boost to it. So then you didn't have to run a million pounds of boost. But again, it all, it, it's all determined by what your needs are, what, like what kind of power goal you have. So if you want, like, if you had a five liter Mustang, you want to make 500 horsepower, you really could turbo the stock one. It worked just fine. Um, but, and, and the same thing for the LS, if you have a four, eight, and your goal is to make 600 horsepower, you just put a little camshaft in it and run boost on it, and it's going to work just fine. In fact, for those kinds of applications, I would do a small cam and a small turbo, because it's if you're not trying to get 1,000 horsepower, there's no reason to leave uh, all of the extra boost and power potential that you leave on the top of whatever turbo that you're, the difference between the power you have and the power that, that turbo can support, that's all response. <laughs> that all could have been on the other side. Um, now I know that I always tell you to leave some there. You, you want to leave some there. You don't want to be using all of it. You don't want to be like maxing out the turbo every time you go into boost. But the thing is, there's no need to have a 1500 horsepower turbo. If you're only trying to, you know, you're, you're only running around at like 700 horsepower. That's just, uh, that's just wasted stuff. So the so turbo engine just mirrors the NA engine. What about the torque converters? You need to run a looser converter. Um, actually, what will, Hugh, what will happen with your torque converter is it will become looser <laughs> because what will happen is that the torque converter, the stall speed of the torque converter is a function not just of the converter design, that's part of it, but it's also the amount of torque you're applying to the converter. So where if you were applying, let's say, 250 foot-pounds and now you're applying 400 or 450 foot-pounds, the, the converter, the stall speed in the converter is going to go up. Uh, Richard, do you really reuse the 200,000 mile rings over or over or to do dyno pulls? Yeah, all of the Big Bang motors reuse the um, reuse the rings, and and all of almost every wrecking yard motor that I've ever gotten that we've run has all just been the rings that were in the motor, and that includes me taking them out and recutting them and then putting them back in. Is scavenging relevant to boost performance or does the back pressure boost pressure relationship kind of nullify that? I, I think that there is something to scavenging with a header design on a turbo application. I just haven't been able to de definitively prove that yet. But the boost pressure, back pressure, I think is a big thing. And then I don't, the scavenging, I haven't decided yet where that falls in relation to the other things. The the size of the, the size, well, the power output and especially the low speed torque output of the of the motor relative to the turbo size is kind of the critical thing um and then other things like free flowing exhaust after the turbo that's kind of an important thing scavenging wouldn't be as high on the list there uh can you have a dual magna flow exhaust with a single turbo and still have it sound good you, the turbo motor is going to sound definitely different than a an na motor with dual exhaust on it the turbo, you could have it come out as a single or have twins and have them each come out. But if you came out as a single and wide it, the fact that it's turbocharged is going to make it sound different because the turbo takes a lot of that exhaust note out. Uh, Richard, 2003 two valve Mustang with S trim running 10 pounds of boost. What should my fuel pressure be? Well, your fuel pressure should be whatever your static pressure is, what your starting pressure is, plus 10 pounds because your boost ref, your regulator should be boost referenced. The, the, the guys are mentioning stuff about having small cams and vacuum and stuff. And that's kind of the nice thing about turbos is that you can drive them around and they drive around almost like you can have mild cams in them that drive like stock cams, but they'll still make a lot of power. Um, and they'll, they can also be quiet and have all of your accessories and AC and all that stuff. If, if that's what you want. Uh, what do you know about Small block Chevy's getting stroked out to 454 inches. They they can do that with the right blocks. They can go bigger than that. Uh, 
A stage two cam is a small cam, okay. I have a six liter L98 auto and it uses the biggest cam it can without a stall converter. They're responsive. <laughs> so 2000 horsepower is the new 800. The uh, Trek Norris cam over the BTR Stage 2. I, I would be inclined to agree with that. I, I think that I would choose a Trek Norris over the Stage 2 Turbo cam. Utah, you're using a 3000 RPM converter. Helps everywhere, especially the quarter mile. It helps with my Pro Charger getting it at the higher RPM. That uh, A higher stall speed converter would be very beneficial on a positive or on a, a centrifugal blower because they don't have very much boost down low so the the more that you move up in engine speed because the the boost is is um correlated to engine speed on on a centrifugal blower where it's really not so much directly on a turbo um and then so then then you what you're doing is if you raise that up you're changing the stall speed on the converter because you're doing that and then also because you're adding more power to it by changing the RPM and the amount of boost that the motor is providing. Uh, I figure less back pressure equals more boost. It's not always the case like that. So you're gonna hit the adventure alone. I'll let you know how it goes. You're stroking a small block out to 454 inches. And you think it's going to make 800 horsepower NA? That's a that's a really good one if you're able to do that. Um, I think that the if you take a look at if you want information on something like that, take a look at what the um, what the off road guys are doing, what they did with their small blocks. They were running 450 or 460 inch small blocks that were making that or more, um, but they're a, a they're an altered valve angle stuff. Um, and they're fairly expensive heads and stuff that they were using, but it, they're, and their stack injection, most of them were, but they were making a lot of power. Or you could also look at it. Um, I don't think that the, I don't think that the um, outlaw, the sprint car motors were that big. Somebody, somebody else here, I'm sure uh, one of these guys knows. Uh, what about blow by on the rings? We didn't have a blow by issue with the big bang motors. The um, the question on the fuel pressure for the two valve, it, your static pressure, I think on a um, on a uh, two valve forge, it, I, if I remember right, I think that they're forty three psi, like the five liters were. They weren't they weren't high pressure. They weren't fifty eight psi like the LS stuff. So I think that they're starting at forty three, and so you'd have forty three plus whatever the boost is. Uh, Richard, how do you like the Holly small buck Chevy EFI intake? I don't know what that part number is. So, uh, and, and also <clears throat> I don't have to see what the manifold is <laughs> to, to possibly answer the question because for boost, it doesn't make any difference. Um, the manifold just does what the manifold does and it will do that with boost or it will do it NA. So if the manifold is a single plane manifold, it's going to act a particular way. If it's a dual plane, it's going to act a particular way and whether it's fuel injected or carbureted, and it's a single plane or a dual plane, it's going to act a particular way, whatever the runner length and all that stuff. It's going to dictate where it wants to run. And manifolds are kind of more um, RPM specific than they are NA or boost specific. The You can make small blocks bigger than 454 inches, but you have to, it's a lot of work. And, and on an LS, it's a lot more than that. 
So once I get an LS and a turbo on my Crown Vic, I can run the straight pipes and it won't be that loud. <laughs> People that are telling you that the turbo takes all of the noise out of it is not accurate. It takes some of it out. Have you ever thought about making a rod ratio video? I, I would like to. But the I, I think it'd be really hard to demonstrate that it does anything. Yeah, the sprint car motors, I think, were smaller than what he was talking about. Jeff, our 6.2 stroked out the 6.8, added the BTR Stage 4 and 3600 stall converter. And the you can the bigger the motor is, the more displacement you have on the motor, the, the bigger that you can make the camshaft too. I, I was thinking sprint car motors were like 410s or something. Um, the World of Outlaw deals, I thought that that's where they were, but um, I I honestly had no, <laughs> know very little about them. Uh, I'm new to the turbo stuff, so I have no idea about back pressure. I always thought back pressure was bad. Back pressure is bad. Um, but the problem is back pressure is inherent in a turbo system. You won't have a turbo system that doesn't have back pressure. You can have a turbo system. And we're, when I'm talking about back pressure, I'm not talking about after the turbo. I'm talking about between the cylinder head and the turbo. You're going to have some back pressure there always. Um, sometimes it can be less than what the boost pressure is. Sometimes it can be the same as the boost pressure. More often than not, it's more than the boost pressure is. So if you have 10 pounds boost, it can be 15 pounds of back pressure or 20 or 30 or depending on the size of the turbo and the combination and what you're doing. Um, normally it's more than the boost pressure, but like on the Bonneville motor that I had, we had less back pressure than boost pressure because we weren't nearly as concerned about response rate because as I, I was talking about earlier, normally those two things go together. So if you have, you know, if you want more response rate, you have a smaller size turbo, which is going to have more back pressure, but it's also going to be more responsive. And so that that's always a trade off. But that's the thing. Is that back pressure bad? If we have, you know, if we have one that's one and a half to one and one that's two to one, are we going to see a big difference between those two? Three sixties and four tens. Yeah, I thought that the, I thought that they had smaller ones too. Rod ratio is important. I, I don't think that it is. Rod ratio is one of the one of the one percent or two percent things. It's not cylinder head. It's not camshaft. It's not intake manifold. It's not displacement. It's not compression. It's not. In, it's not even. It's not even exhaust. It's not oiling system. <laughs> like it's not windage tray. I, I think if we tested windage trays, we'd see a lot more power than we would ever see by changing rod ratio. So that's that's how I feel. The Turbo 3800 sounded sounded really good. I can't wait to run that thing again. I tested on the Dyna results in early 90s and L20 in a Datsun 510 rally car changing rod ratio made an unmeasurable difference. That That's kind of what I would think. Um, I've seen a couple of results that I, I question. Um, and I've had a lot of really, really sharp guys tell me that it's you're not going to see anything. Um, I think we might see something if we applied it to the right combination maybe but again you're 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 going into like the third or fourth level of things where you're kind of splitting hairs and you have to make it you have to make the combination be right to show things and so i don't really look at that stuff too much because what i'm talking about mostly are street strip kind of combinations you know go to the wrecking yard to pick that up and if i were to change the 4.8 from one length rod to another length rod 
how do you do that and test that without also altering the piston and you know yada yada so it's a, it's a really hard thing to only change the rod because here's the question if we change the rod length and the, and we manage to do it with only changing the rod length we talk about this every night and only change the rod length you're also going to change the rod weight so unless you change the rod length and then alter the design of the rod somehow or the material or drill holes in it whatever you want to do to change the rod length back to so that the or, or so that the rod weight is exactly the same that but then you've also changed the design of the rod so what happens there is the is the resonance frequency now of the rod changed will that make an effect that's the thing it gets you get into the minutia of stuff and it's really hard to determine what kind of thing actually makes a change and then what we attribute that to uh, cast iron exhausts or fabricated log manifolds for a street turbo. They they will all work. Uh, that's the great thing about a turbo setup is stock exhaust manifolds work good. Um, the Schedule 40 stuff, where all of that works. And I just get all the exhaust to the turbo and it works just fine. Never seen a 410 sprint car that one races ever be actually 410 inches as the rod ratios don't live long at 80. So you think the rod ratio is what's allowing the motor to live? Uh, yeah, Thomas, 11 to 1, 496 with twin S470 size <laughs> is still loud. Any unmuffled motor, even turbo motors can be loud. I'm new here. What are we talking about? We're talking about all kinds of stuff. So here is our um, here is our poll. Would you pick a smaller cam than the BTR Stage 2 Turbo Cam for your Turbo 5.3? Most people are saying no. Most people are going the big cam route. So they're looking at we're looking at 61% saying no and 39% saying that they would go to a smaller cam. It's hard. To, I mean, if you look at sales of the cams, because there's a Stage 2, nobody wants to buy the Stage 1 and 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 the stage three even more and the stage four nobody wants to say yeah i bought a stage one <laughs> never mind that it runs better and drives better uh it's all the stage four right for the chop uh, i would run an ls3 cam my 5.3 they're pretty soft down low compared to the 5.3 cam but it will definitely make more power up top Uh, Turbos, cams, back pressure, boost pressure, and exhaust flow all affect stuff. Yes, they do. Talk to any of the pro stock engine builders. Rod ratio doesn't matter very much <clears throat> at all. They all rev the 500 cubic inch pro stock motors to over 10,500 RPM. That seems like a lot. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the LS3 cam is not ideal. Take a look at the at the video that I have up comparing all the stock camshafts, and then you'll see that the, the LS3 cam loses um, quite a bit down low compared to the stock cam. There are other better cams for it, but if you have that laying around, it will make power. Compression ratio of a non-PI462 valve block with PI heads. Uh, I, th I don't know if it's eight and a half, but or 10 and a half. And, might be 10 or low 10s. Do you think a 543 valve Ford mod engine is as bad as everyone says? I, I don't know. I, I've never run one. Um, I've only run the 4.6 stuff. Uh, the 347 versus 351 was a rod ratio. <laughs> Test, not really. <laughs> they were such different combinations.
so that they've <laughs> this is the thing you're the a rod ratio discussion is a different discussion than a rod length discussion so a rod ratio is you're also changing the stroke so that's something different <laughs> Uh, you should test a set of GESI catalytic converters. I've never even heard of them. Uh, what horsepower are we talking about on the cam choice? Well, on the on the on the pole, if that's what you're talking about, the the five three made like seven, <clears throat> I don't know, seven fifty or something like that, eleven pounds. Uh, what is the best mod to do on a 5.3 without opening the engine? The best mod to do on a 5.3 without opening the engine would be boost. Um, and then, but you need a camshaft is is the number one thing that you should do. Nothing else is going to make the a power gain on an NA 5.3 like a camshaft. And then if you don't want to open it up, just add a turbo to it. Not really on topic, but has anyone looked at some of the new Torquenator cams? I haven't ever tested one, but I've looked at the specs. How much lift can you safely get away with with a set of BTR 600 lift springs? Um, I, I don't know. You, you could, it's They're designed for 600 lift cams, so I don't know. You'd have to measure coil bind on that. And then you'd also, I would also be concerned about retainer to seal on that to see where that is. I don't know what the ultimate coil bind is on that. Admiral, they rate their six inch Gen 2 core to 1200 horsepower per cat. That's a lot. <laughs> that I don't think that that would restrict anything that I've run <laughs> if we had two of those. Uh, Daniel, you like the video on the Big Bang Six Liter? Yeah, that was that one was a lot of fun. Okay, two more minutes. Danger, danger. Uh, Jesse, what kind of converter would you use on a single GT45, 5.3, Turbo 400, and a C10 just for cruising? What? <clears throat> I think you might kind of need to know the weight and the gearing, the rear gear on that to, to figure it out. But something in the 2,000 to 3,000, maybe. Two-minute warning. Well, uh, Patina, we all know we all know what rod length does, and we all know how to measure it, and we all know what it does. My question is, is if you only change the rod length, that's it, not the stroke length, not not, and you only change the length of the rod, without changing anything else, does it change the power? That's my question. Not if you change the stroke to not any of that. 
not if you change the piston design, not if you change, <laughs> you know, I just want to see if the rod length changes anything. And, and I don't think that it does. Do you have a schedule for going live? Yeah, usually it's seven o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. I try to do it most nights, so you can usually find us here. Uh, I bought a Blueprint Power Router 400, placing an 871 on 871. That's pretty good size. What's the boost limit? I don't. There's not a boost limit. You would be looking at a power limit for that. Um, I don't know what. Uh, I don't remember what camshaft's in there. I think we changed the camshaft on the one that we had. <laughs> rod holes. <laughs> yeah. I've seen rods that have that done where they've uh, drilled or machined or cast holes in it like that to, to keep the, keep the weight out. I'm a little skeptical of that. It looks iffy to me um, from a strength standpoint, but maybe, maybe it works. I, if Okay, then this will be the last comment for tonight because i got to get going. On the 871, what we do when we run it on the dyno is we start out at very low boost, three or four pounds. So what I do is put the combination of pulleys on that's the lowest amount of boost that we can run. And then because we normally run the motor NA just to make sure that the motor's right and not leaking and we know where the NA power is so that when we put the blower on there, we have an idea kind of of where the thing should be. Not that it follows the formula with a 671 or an 871 because it doesn't because it takes a lot to spin one of those things and they're not terribly efficient. So and 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 with no intercooler and that kind of stuff. And, you know, if you're running 85 through them, they're really, really like that. But we start out at the lowest booth level and then we just start because it's so easy to change pulleys. We just then start swapping pulleys. And I don't ever go from the least amount of boost to the most amount of boost because, you know, I, I would go up in steps and go, OK, look, we're making three pounds or five pounds or whatever you're starting on an 871. You may be starting out at seven pounds or eight pounds or something like that by spinning at the least amount. We always have a but we have a bunch of pulleys to choose from so we can start out with the. 65 on top and, and the, uh, the, I don't know, 50 on the bottom or something. And then, and then we just start changing them around. We can go up, you know, we'll change it by five teeth or five teeth or five teeth, you know, and then start swapping around. And then we eventually get to the point where we run all of it, but we don't just jump all in. And the same thing when like, you know, like when we go racing at Bonneville, you don't set the motor on kill and go out and try to make a hero pass. You, you go out and just make a pass and make sure Make sure you tighten all the bolts, make sure the motor runs, make sure the data log is working, make sure that the driver's happy, whatever. You do all of that, and then you make a pass and go, okay, it seems like it's ready. Let's go out and, you know, let's turn it up and set some sort of record run, and then we can, you know, do what we do what we need to do. So I got to finish the poll here, and then I got to get going. So it's looking like it stayed at 61% uh, no. So most people um, would go with the bigger cam on a Turbo 5.3. That's interesting. So we'll end that poll and say good night. <laughs> Thanks again, once again, for talking more about uh, uh, connecting rod length and rod ratio and stuff. We seem to go on that all of the time. So obviously I need to do a test on it to, to see what's going on. But the thing is, if I do a test on it, all, all that will happen is, well, you, you know, it, that the cylinder head that you pick doesn't doesn't like rod ratio or it has too much blowdown or you know whatever the things are going to be. So there's no there's no absolute test going to be the absolute test and people are still going to talk about it and 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 maybe it does things on certain combinations or whatever all of that's fine except that um again it's always it, to me it's the it's a 1% thing over here that that we don't that I don't really worry about because a lot of guys will talk about like Oh, here I changed the displacement from 350 inches to 400 inches. Oh, yeah, you got a much better rod ratio. Now that's what that's what was responsible for the power. No, it was the 50 cubic inches that really made the power. Thank you guys for all all for showing up. I hope you guys took a look at the video that's up, and I will see you all tomorrow.